The Prophet Muhammad, born in 570 and died in 632. He was born an orphan and was brought up in the village Taif in Arabia. He was subsequently raised in a town of Mecca by his extended family. He worked as a shepherd and a merchant and he never set foot inside a school or college and was known to have been Ummi or an illiterate man. He came to be known to his fellow countrymen for his absolute honesty, impeccable character and strong sense of justice and fair play. So much so that they fondly called him Al-Amin, the trustworthy, and Al-Sadiq, the truthful. He led a hitherto uneventful life without in any way showing the signs of a great man that he was to be. Arabia was not necessarily known for rearing men of universal appeal and renown. His birth put an end to that drought and, for the first time in their history, the Arab descendants of the great patriarch Abraham in Arabic Ibrahim had something they could truly celebrate, the birth of the most influential man ever to walk on earth. His name means the praiseworthy one. To some Arabs, history actually began in 570, the year in which their greatest son was born into a noble Meccan tribe of Quraysh in present-day Saudi Arabia, a direct descendant of Ishmael, in Arabic Ismail, the father of the Semitic Arab race, he single-handedly dragged the Arab people from being a footnote in human history to be the founders of one of history's greatest civilization. More importantly, he accomplished such an unprecedented feat without any wherewithal. Caesar had the pomp and power of Rome. Alexander had a mighty army. Heraclius had immense wealth and resources, while Napoleon was trained at a military academy. But he had none of these things. He started with nothing, but ended up with a whole world. That was the greatness of a man called Muhammad, history's most incomparable religious and political genius. Living in 7th century Arabia, Muhammad became increasingly detached from the superstitious beliefs and practice of his people. He began to explore and take a closer interest in spiritual matters by secluding himself on the Mount of Light, Jabal al-Nur, situated on the outskirts of the Arabian town of Mecca. For meditation and spiritual renewal, as political corruption, social inequities, economic disparities between the poor and the rich, and religious superstition and tribal conflict increasingly became the order of the day in Mecca, and across Arabia, Muhammad began to search for serious answers to his society's maladies. As he approached his 40th birthday, his meditation and retreat on the Mount of Light intensified and reached its climax during one night in the month of Ramadan, which resulted in a direct visitation from the Archangel Gabriel, Jibrail in Arabic, conveying to him the first of a series of divine revelations which he continued to receive until his death in 632. The angel confirmed that he, Muhammad, was God's last and final prophet, Nabi, to humanity, and that the Quran, consisting of 114 chapters, surah of variable lengths, was God's last and final revelation, wahi, to humankind. This divine intervention in history marked the beginning of Muhammad's prophetic mission. The result was that Islam, which means submission to the will of one God, Allah in Arabic, completely transformed Muhammad. And he went out to invite his fellow countrymen to the worship of one God. From that day onwards, the promulgation and propagation of Islam became Muhammad's main preoccupation in life. As soon as the Prophet publicly announced the message of Islam, some especially those who had suffered hardship under the oppressive rule of the Meccan oligarchy, responded positively to his call. However, the ruling Meccan elites became very hostile and abusive towards Muhammad as soon as the implication of his new message became clear to them. In a fiercely feudalistic, tribally entrenched and paternalistic Meccan society, the message of Islam advocated the need for a different approach to politics, social justice, economics, and human spirituality. Indeed, in a grossly unjust and unfair Mecca, and the Arabian society as a whole, 
The Prophet's message of freedom, equality, justice, fair play and brother slash sisterhood was nothing short of a breath of fresh air. Not surprisingly, the status quo maintained and perpetuated by a handful of tribal chieftains in order to protect their own political economic interests soon came under direct threat from Islam. Thus, the Prophet and his message became the main target of their hostility and enmity. Undaunted by the severity of the hardship and the hostilities directed towards him and his small band of followers, Muhammad continued to proclaim the message of Islam in and around Mecca for more than a decade. In 622, the Prophet was invited by a delegation from the nearby oasis of Yathrib to move to their city. The Prophet accepted the offer and moved to Yathrib, which later became known as Madinatul Nabi, the city of the Prophet. The Prophet's migration to Medina, known as a Hijra, thus became a momentous event in Islamic history. The Islamic calendar, known as the Hijri calendar, is dated back to the day the Prophet left his native Mecca for Medina. In this beautiful Arabian oasis, the Prophet received a hero's welcome. As its inhabitants came out in their droves and pledged their allegiances to him by embracing Islam, from that day onwards, Medina became a very special place for all Muslims and it also became the hub of Islamic learning, Islamic culture and civilization for all time to come. When the Meccan chiefs were informed about the Prophet's success in Medina, they were shocked and alarmed. Having tried to undermine him and his mission in Mecca and failed most miserably, they now conspired to create unrest in Medina by setting factions of hypocrites, rival tribes and pagans, Jews and new immigrants, the Muhajirun from Mecca, against each other. But thanks to the Prophet's polished diplomatic skills, their strategies came to nothing. Undeterred, the Meccan chiefs then marched to Medina with a large contingent in order to obliterate the nascent Muslim community. The Prophet and his small band of followers met their advancing Meccan army at the plain of Badr, located on the outskirts of Medina. More than 1,000 strong and well-equipped Meccan army fought just over 300 ill-equipped and unprepared Muslims. Miraculously, the Prophet and his followers inflicted a crushing defeat on the Meccan foes. The Muslims returned to Medina in elation, while the Meccan army returned home in total disarray. Determined to avenge their humiliation, the unrelenting Meccan chiefs attempted to obliterate the Muslims on a few other occasions, but they failed to breach the stiff defences put up by Muslims. Demoralised by their failure to wipe out the Muslims, the Meccan were eventually forced to agree to a treaty with the Prophet and make peace. Even though the terms and conditions of the treaty were biased in favour of the Meccans, the Prophet agreed to sign it, despite protestation from some of his companions. This was a shrewd move on his part, however, because this period of peace gave the people of Mecca the opportunity to see Islam in action in Medina for the very first time. During their journey to Medina, the Meccans saw society utterly transformed. The Prophet had turned a warring and bitterly divided oasis into a thriving civil society. For the first time in its history, tribal factionalism, social injustice, economic inequities, political oppression, physical torture and abuse, maltreatment of women and cruelty towards slaves were no longer the order of the day in Medina. On the contrary, fraternity between the believers, love, understanding and cooperation between kiths and kin, respect for the right of women, freeing of slaves and an unrivaled interest in learning and education became the key feature of the new society created by the Prophet. Only a few hundred miles away from Mecca, this unparalleled transformation of the tribal society and its people's hearts, their minds, thoughts, morals and customs was accomplished by the Prophet and done so within a matter of decades. Muhammad led the people of Medina by his personal example. He did not say one thing and do another, whether it was in the intense heat of the battlefield or during prayer in the mosque, during the daylight or in the middle of the night, at times of hunger and hardship or in times of happiness and joy. He was at the forefront of everything. The people of Medina became so fond of him that they meticulously moulded their actions, behaviour and even their style of dressing, eating, drinking and sleeping 
in accordance with the Prophet's norms and practices. To them, the Prophet Muhammad was simply Al-Insan Al-Kamil, the perfect human being. Such unfailing love and devotion shown to their leader by people was not only unheard of, it was also unprecedented in the annals of history. In the year 630, the Prophet and a large contingent of his devout followers marched into Mecca, the city of his birth, without a single drop of blood being shed. On seeing him enter Mecca, the people of the city came out in their droves and pledged allegiance to him by embracing Islam. The Prophet's most harshest critic and opponent, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, was however offered protection by none other than the Prophet's uncle, Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. Typical of the Prophet on entering Mecca, he announced that anyone who took shelter in the courtyard of the sacred Kaaba, in the house of Abu Sufyan, or remained indoors would be safe. Even Abu Sufyan knew when Muhammad made a promise he would stick to it, come what may. The next morning, however, by Ibn Abbas, he went straight to the Prophet and most willingly pledged allegiance to him. The Prophet forgave him for his persistent past misdeeds and told him that he was free to go about his business as a free man. This was an extraordinary act of clemency and compassion. Hitherto, Abu Sufyan had been unrelenting in his pursuit of the Prophet and his followers, but Muhammad chose to forgive him, to forgive and forget, rather than seek retribution. That was the quality and greatness of a man called a mercy to humankind. With the conversion of Mecca and its neighbouring towns to the fold of Islam, the Prophet accomplished a feat never achieved by an Arab before him, namely to unite the consistently bickering and rival Arabian tribes under the banner of a common denominator. And that common denominator was Islam which transcended all tribal affiliations and internal factionalism. As it collectively channeled the Arabs' might and energy in one direction, namely the dissemination of Islam, and in doing so they transformed the course of human history forever. Muhammad, the Prophet par excellence, and the Qur'an, the divine revelation, thus combined to inspire the Muslims of Arabia to achieve the unprecedented success which they subsequently achieved. In just over two decades, Muhammad radically transformed a hitherto neglected, barren, primitive Arabian peninsula into a thriving center of learning, culture, commerce, and civilization. And by all accounts, this was a truly remarkable achievement, unprecedented not only in Arab society, but also global history. As he approached his 60th birthday, he knew his mission was drawing to a close. In the 10th year of the Hijrah, the Prophet performed his farewell pilgrimage and delivered one of the most powerful, eloquent, and inspiring sermons ever composed by a religious leader. Standing on the plain of Arafah in front of thousands around him, he began by praising and thanking God and saying, O people, lend me an attentive ear, for I do not know whether after this year I would meet you again. Therefore, listen to what I'm saying to you right now, very carefully, and take these words to those who could not be present to this day. O oh people, just as you regard this month, this day, this city as sacred, so regard the life and property of every Muslim as a sacred trust. Return the goods entrusted to you to their rightful owners. Hurt no one, so that no one may hurt you. Remember that you will appear before God and answer for all your actions. All due of interest shall therefore be cancelled, and you will all have your capital back. God has forbidden interest you will neither inflict nor suffer inequity. Beware of Satan for the safety of your religion. He has lost all hope that he will ever be able to lead you astray in great things. So be aware of him in the smaller things. Oh people, your wives, your wives, your wives have a certain right over you and you have a certain right over them. Treat them well and be kind to them for they are your partners and committed helpers. And it is your right that they do not make friends with anyone who you do not like, as well as never being unchaste. Oh, people, listen to me carefully. Worship God. Perform your five daily prayers. Fast in the month of Ramadan. Pay your alms and make the pilgrimage, if you can afford it, that is. All humanity is from Adam and Eve. There is no superiority for an Arab 
over a non-Arab. No superiority for a non-Arab over an Arab. No superiority of a white man over a black man. No superiority for a black man over a white man, except through piety. All the believers are brothers and sisters, and the believers constitute one nation. You are not allowed to take the things belonging to another Muslim unless he gives it to you willingly. Do not therefore do injustice to yourself. People, reflect on my words. Remember one day you will appear before God and answer for your deeds. Beware. Do not stray from the path of righteousness after I'm gone. People, be mindful of those who work under you. Feed and clothe them as you feed and clothe yourselves. People, no prophet or messenger will come after me, and no new faith will be born. Reason, reason well, therefore, and understand the words that I convey to you. I leave behind with me two things, the Quran and my example, the Sunnah. And if you follow these, you will not go astray. All those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and those to others again. And may the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me right now directly. Bear witness. Bear witness, O God, that I've conveyed your message to your people. The Prophet Muhammad was an outstanding orator and a master of succinctness. He spoke only when required. And he did so in a brief but comprehensive manner. This sermon illustrates how beautiful and surpassed his oratory and communication skills were. Although he was illiterate, he could nevertheless communicate with men and with women, with the young and the aged, with the learned as well as the unlettered in a masterly fashion. Even his critics admired his sound logic, sharp intellect, organisational abilities and his down-to-earth approach. He was neither extreme nor too lax in his words or deeds. Instead, he preached and practised moderation in everything. Whenever he was given an option between two things, he always chose the easy option and encouraged his companions to make religion easy for the people. According to his wife Aisha, he was the walking Qur'an, who was very kind and very generous to those around him, and personified angelic qualities and attributes. With the successful completion of his mission, the Prophet returned to Medina, where he passed away at the age of 63. The Prophet Muhammad's achievements are so varied and extensive that it would require a separate book to fully document them. He was an unusually gifted man who radically transformed the course of human history by the sheer dint of his unique character and powerful personality. Today, more than 1400 years after his death, his powerful message and teachings continue to influence humankind's journey in tune with the march of time. No other single human being has been able to influence our minds, our thoughts, our ideas and our destinies like him. That is why the Prophet Muhammad is not only the greatest Muslim, he is also the most influential man ever to walk the earth.